And finally, just to introduce our very first uh, guest for the evening, my second, uh, the second one of my favorite anthropologists. She, indeed, she needs no introduction. Uh, let me just say that uh, very recently, in uh, one of her uh, uh, amazing uh, blog posts, she posited a question that I think captures very well uh, the ambivalence of trade. That annoying question, where are you from? <laughs> Followed by the even more annoying uh, uh, question, no, but where are you really from? <laughs> so please join me to welcome our dear Usma Grisby. I was wondering who, this, who the favorite anthropologist was. I was like, what? <laughs> who is that? Um, well, thank you. Thank you for that lovely introduction. And thank you, Shimon and Antonia and, and all other folks who I know make GAF possible. Um, uh, Salam alaikum, everyone. Good evening. Uh, I hope you're not too cold. I'm quite cold, so I can imagine that you might be as well. Um, so we're going to have slides, and we're going to have, I'm going to try to keep it to time, because I have a lot to cover. And uh, I have a lot to say. So as Oscar mentioned, I'm an anthropologist. I'm uh, also an archaeologist. That's my specialty. And one of the first things people often ask me when they hear of my practice, especially here, uh, is that, yes, but is there anything archaeological here in the UAE? Right? And that's, it's, it's a sort of common question I get here. Um, as if there were nothing archaeological. But of course, the quick answer is yes. And in the next 20 minutes, I'm going to give you some sense of uh, what we're doing here and what's happening. Um, and anyone who's ho heard me speak prior to tonight will know little bits of what sorts of deep history we do have, because I often talk about it. The slide you see here marks a few of the archaeological sites that have been excavated. At this very moment, we have four ongoing excavations that are happening. So we have teams on the ground right now as well. I just want to show a couple of specific sites for you to kind of, uh, kind of earmark. Everyone knows what this is. Yes, this is the UAE. <laughs> All right, so some of the sites I want you to pay attention to is here, Omal Nar, it's gonna come up a few times. Uh, here's Hilly, another fantastic site. If you haven't been there, there's an archeological park there. You should try, to try it out, check it out. Asima is another important site on here on the East Coast, and Tel Abrak. I'm just pointing these out because these are gonna be uh, sites I'm gonna talk about um, throughout the course of the, the next 20 minutes, or 19 now. Um, so the sites that you see here range in dates with the earliest at about 5,000 BCE, all the way into the historic time period. Um, I'm going to show you uh, an Arabian, if I can, an Arabian bifacial, just because I feel like everyone should at least see one at some point in their life. Um, so this is roughly about 5,000 BC. We find these at many different sites around uh, the UAE in many different topographic, many different environmental zones. So this is something that ubiquitous, around 5,000. Um, and one of the important aspects about these bifacial tools is that they're remarkably precise and delicate in their crafting. As I said, it's not the main topic of my talk, but I just felt like everyone should see one um, and just appreciate its, its remarkable um, precision and its, and its beauty, actually. They're incredibly gorgeous. So what I'm interested in doing is taking a look at this uh, archaeological site, all the different archaeological sites in the UAE. And my main interest, my research work that I've been doing here for many years now is, in fact, in trading places. And I mean that as a geographic and uh, thinking about these trading places as geographic and temporal locales of exchange, as Antonia mentioned, as well as the res residue of cosmopolitanism it engenders and how a history of mobility of things engenders a fluid subject position and an identity that is linked as much to the movement as it is to the settlement of such traffic. For the past two decades, I have been asking questions of such movements. The first iteration of such cosmopolitan populations at a large scale is during the third millennium BCE. So I'm now taking you back 5,000 years, right? So we're looking at roughly 2,600 BCEs where I want everyone's imagination to kind of move to. This is what we in the world of archaeology call the time of the first cities. This is the first wave of urban life, of urban plans, of long distance regional trade. And these urban scapes are traditionally thought of as residing within the civilizations of Mesopotamia, Egypt, and the Indus or the Harappan world. And again, as I said, the focus is about 2600 BCE. 
My recent interest in the UAE has to do with the impact of those urban lifestyles and movement of goods, ideas, people, things across these urban networks. So that this region becomes a key player in regional politics, economics, cultural, and societies. Sort of the recognition of that. During the latter half of the third millennium, or roughly 2300 BCE, I know it's, there's a lot of dates and a lot of information, but the pictures are coming, so don't worry. The Gulf is a vibrant, at this time, 2300 BCE, the Gulf is a vibrant cosmopolitan mix of ethnicities, goods, services, spices, textiles, sandalwood, carnelian, and geographic concern, so that naming places becomes very significant. And so we are provided some early articulations of cartographic othering and identification. And so what I'm going to show you here is a map based on the geography, these place names, the large ones here like Maluha, right here, Magan, Dilman, and Akkad and Sumer. These place names come from Ur-3 economic texts. Um, and it's in that time period that these place names are remarked upon in terms of the materials that are coming and going, as well as the people who are moving through these spaces. I'm referring to these economic texts for certain reasons. There are many other texts I could have used, but of course, we're thinking about trade and economics, so this became very important to me to kind of go back to those. But more than that, in the translation from Akkadian, we learn a lot about the social and cultural lives of the individuals, and how they lived with and next to each other, and how they knew the other and how they got to, reached, and moved between one another. In fact, one of my favorite quotes that begins one of these texts is, and I quote, I won't quote it in Akkadian, I'll just read it in English for you guys. The ships from Maluha, the ships from Magan, the ships from Dilman, he tied up alongside the quay of Akkad, right? So we have here an, a sort of textual image of a very vibrant port where you have ships that have come from these disparate places all the way to Akkad. Because these are economic texts and the focus of these texts are on the movement of goods and people, we also have mentioned in these texts the sons and the children of Maluha living in neighborhoods in Ur, right? Where the smells of their food are unique and the materials available are distinct. Now Ur is here in Akkad, right there. I don't know if you can see it right there. So we have these children of Maluha living here, and we have that in documentary text from about 2300 BC. There are deep histories to these stories, texts to grapples with, uh, artifacts to uncover, but for now, in this limited time I have with you, I do want to focus our attention on Magan and its relationship to Maluha, and what deep history of here might entail. So we are here in Magan, and I want to kind of think about this Maluhan relationship. It always helps to visualize this moving from Maluha to here, and so I'm going to show you an image of that same ceiling, but also of this right here, up here, the ceiling. The Ur-3 economics texts come from a slightly later period than the one in which the first urban projects in this part of the world were coming to fruition. My own uh, sort of expertise lies in those urban projects, the architecture, the infrastructure, and politics that are based in Maluha, and the millennia of relationships that have existed between these two re uh, regions. This ceiling from Mohenjo-daro of a boat from roughly about 2600 BC has served as my inspiration to think about the deep history of links between these land masses. Conceptually one that does not treat gulfs as spaces of separation, but rather as places of fluid encounter. And if we hesitate for a moment longer in that conceptual space, we recognize the contemporary nature of that deep history, that deep history of these boats in these seas. Here is an image, it's a screen grab of a live feed of marine traffic in the early hours of the morning last week. To me, these routes are well-traveled and known, and that history of this lay in 5,000 years of movement from pots full of olive oil, microsteatite beads, Identity, spices, indigo, subjectivities, carnelian beads, cultural forms, ivory combs, social institutions, weights, seals. I mean, I could go on and on, as you can tell. It is also, it is, it is imperative to be able to link these forms of movement to those on land and not to consider them as separate. Because even if they are utilizing distinct forms of transportation and connections, the histories between people, communities, and environments, the systems that propel them, the system that is in motion, 
actually, and the infrastructure of, of trade is the same. So really this is an issue, a, a distinction of a sort of um, technological innovation and shifting, which does in fact change the culture of that movement, but the system that keeps it going is one and the same. Now I want to show you an, another map, this is going to be like a map full presentation. These small black dots are Harappan sites, Indus Harappan sites, that have been excavated and what we have been calling Maluha. There are over 450 of them shown here, but this map is now decade old because I'm growing old and my maps are not growing with me. Um, but they will and we'll, we'll have a, a few more of those. I'll show you a couple more uh, maps as we go along. So there are many more sites that could populate this map and so rather than an either or situation of land or sea, I'd like us to begin to think both as continuous and perhaps not of shores or shorelines, but as thresholds. Now here's another map and just to show you kind of what I'm thinking about. Um, and this is, uh, again, it doesn't have all the sites because I think it's important to just to not complicate it too much so you can actually see where the movement of things are. But again, this is 3rd millennium BC, so 2600 BC. And what this shows is a direction of materiality, kind of moving between these excavated sites. So again, some sites that I've mentioned to you already, Omanar, right here, Hilly. This is in Oman, uh, Ras al Juns, and there's also Ras al Had here. There is material coming from these sites that's moving between all of these areas. I'm sorry it's cut off on the top here. But Shahar Soka is an online port. So it's on, on, online. Did I say online? Yes. Oh, on land. <laughs> so that is on land. It's great. Um, I am but a product of my time. So here, Shahar Soka, Tepe Yaya, Mundigak up here. And then moving up uh, north towards Central Asia. We have a lot of materials that have been moving between that Central Asian corridor into Maluha and then on, on to Magan and Dilman and then to Akkad, right, and to uh, Ur. And it's, it's an incredibly vibrant sort of economic time. So all this to say, as I said, a vibrant time in our history with the movement of people, things, ideas, animals, germs, dreams, everything, literally. Archaeologists document these forms of exchange as we find things that culturally link one place that are found in another. Just again to help with that visualization. So how do we know that things are being traded? It's because in these distinct sites, we actually find materials from different places that we can then um, do neutron activation analysis on chemical analysis that shows us where the materials are actually coming from. So just to give you some quick images of things, these are very quintessential um, Harappan pots. We find the same design and the same material, and I'll show you some of those examples um, here in Hilly as well as at Omanar. So just to give you some sense of what they look like, and then you'll see the same things uh, a little later. We also have from uh, the Harappan world a lot of jewelry, loved their jewelry. So much jewelry comes out of Harappan sites. We have gold, we have silver, we have uh, carnelian beads, we have lapis that's coming in from Afghanistan, we have turquoise coming in from Central Asia, and they, and they make and they process this. There's some key types of um, beads, the bead work, that emerges from uh, South Asia, and that's the etched carnelian, and so I'll show you some of that very soon as well. We have a lot of terracotta figurines. So we have, um, this is just one of my favorites because it's an ox cart. I like oxes, I don't, I don't know why. Um, but I like them because they move things around and they're kind of humble beasts. Um, and so we have some of these. We have a lot of the, these that show up. We also have uh, figurines, female figurines. This is again just to give you some sense of what's moving around on these trade networks. We have a lot of seals and sealings. So seals are basically the um, sort of the material that is used, the seal itself, that is then impressed on wet clay that leaves a mark. So the sealings are the ones that have mark. These are this, for example, would be considered a sealing. This is all Harappan script um, that has not been deciphered yet, if anybody is interested in deciphering. Um, here are two of my favorite Indus seals. Again, uh, thinking about craftsmanship, thinking about the movement of these things, thinking about the seals in all of these different locations. And here's the crux of what we've come to talk about. Weights. These are Indus weights. The Indus world was remarkably um, sort of precise in its standardization. All of the bricks that have been made in the Harappan world are to a very specific ratio. In the same way, we have um, standardized weights everywhere uh, in the world that come from the Harappan world. Now, I just want to let this sink in just for a minute. This is from 5,000 years ago, right? These are weights that are standardized from 5,000 years ago that have been found in this part of the world as well as all of those parts of the world that we were just looking at. 5,000 years ago, there was a standardized market value established by the weights of these blocks. 
And each one of these sets that we find in all the various ports and markets that I just showed you um, are standardized. Obviously with time and chipping, they're a few milligrams off, but for the most part, these cubicle weights, as they are graduated in sizes, the weight conforms to a standard binary weight system. And I'm not going to go into the full binary weight system here, but just to give you some numbers to kind of hold on to. The smallest weight in the series is 0 0.856 grams, and the most common weight that we find is about 13.7 grams, which is in the 16th ratio. In the larger weights, the system becomes, a there's a decimal increase where the largest weight is 100 times the weight of the 16th ratio in the binary system. So again, just to give, again, I'm not going to go into the binary system too much, but to give you some sense of how precise their ideas of value and standardization were. We find these weights all across the Harappan landscape. And again, just to go back to our map, we find them through the third and second millennium at sites such as Shortagai, Tepe Yagya, the regions of Magan, Mil, uh, Dilman, and Sumer, and Akkad. So here's uh, Tepe Yagya right here, Magan, Maluha, Dilman, Sumer. We find these weights in all of these locations. It would make sense that we would find weights in the regions and on sites where active trading was taking place between the Maluhan world and the region. But it's not just weights that we find. We also find pottery, seals, beads, ivory in all of these regions as well. Now, I just want to give you a couple examples from the Sumerian world, literally just two, a couple. This is from Kish and this is from Ur, right? These are both uh, in contemporary Iraq, and this is material that was made in, we've done uh, sort of um, chemical analysis. These were made in South Asia, in Maluha, and they were found in these different um, areas. Now, because I'm more interested in bringing it home, let that one sink in. Within the UAE ambit, just to bring it here, uh, one of the key sites we have located such cosmopolitan material from has been the Omar Nala burials. The vast majority of our better preserved examples show literally hundreds of individuals were buried in these tombs, along with a wide range of grave furniture, including soft stone bowls, fine and domestic black on red ceramic. We have gray and black painted uh, pottery from southeastern Iran and Balochistan. We have material from uh, copper bronze weaponry, um, as well as jewelry. Uh, we have many of those microsteatite beads that come from the Harappan uh, sort of world. And we also have other items such as ivory combs, gypsum lamps, and linen. Settlements such as Tel Abrak, Hilly 8, and Asima and Ras al-Khaimah in, in, in the northern areas have yielded diagnostic examples of black washed, finely levigated, thick, micaceous orange ware from the Indus Valley. So this right here, this is all, in, this is all Maluhan material that is on display. Um, at the Hilly Archaeological Center. So I invite you all to go and take a look at it. These are from the various excavations. We have all the materials here. These certainly represent certain fragments of storage jars suggesting that there's something being exported from the Harappan world to the UAE. And based on some of the early chemical analysis, it seems like there's some sort of milky product that's coming here. So maybe perhaps some sort of cheese has been coming here. The presence of diagnostically Harappan etched carnelian beads, uh, as well as uh, many thousands of paste microbeads and cubicle chert weights, are all uh, found at Harappan sites, as well as found here. So these are um, found, you can, you can go and see them in Ras al-Khaimah at the museum there, um, and it's, it's right there for you all to see. Now, finally, this is, and this is kind of where I'm coming to, and in conclusion. This is the ivory comb I, I mentioned earlier. This is found at a tomb at Tel Abrak. And it can be identified based on its floral decoration as being an import from uh, Bactria, which is northern Afghanistan or uh, southern Uzbekistan, while others have considered it to be a Harappan uh, import, primarily because of its ivory. Right? What is most interesting about this comb, however, is that in its multiple possible points of origin, it provides us a moment to stop and consider what it might mean when we make it into an object of study and try to point to some ontological certain location of origin. It looks like it belongs in Bactria, and yet its ivory is most likely from the Harappan landscape, and it was found deep in the earth at Umanar. This suggests, if nothing else, that by the second millennium BCE, that is roughly 4,000 years ago, we have artifacts that are elusive in their origin, cosmopolitan in their makeup, and claim belonging to elsewhere. As an anthropologist, I'm always wary to have people believe that artifacts equal people. But artifacts certainly have their own circuits of meaning, semiotic landscapes, and entangled relationships with deep histories. And in this case, just by providing all of you with an all too brief snippet of what archaeology can tell us about trading places, I hope I leave all of you with a better sense of the vibrancy of the landscapes 
and the cosmopolitan nature and the fluid shifting subjectivities that we are all inhabiting. Thank you.